<laughs> oh, you made me do it. <laughs> Weird. Odd. I got it for the moment. We're having a good time. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't even know where to start, you know. Sometimes, sometimes there's just, well, there's so much, you know what I'm saying, that it's hard to pinpoint one thing. Um, I learned a lot. Learned a lot. Got full. You're good, full. Good and full. Good and full. <laughs> yeah. I got to experience a lot too. Um, you know, want to go down there. I think it was. I thought, oh, it'd be so cool to see miracles. It'd be so cool to see these things. And on my way down there, God spoke to me. He said, "Do you believe already?" Well, yeah, I guess I do. <laughs> he said, okay, then you're not going there to see. Mm. And so, I said, what in the world am I going? Why am I driving? <laughs> what am I doing? And uh, and he started to leave me. We're praying and we're thinking and we're talking. And I'm seeking God about, God, what is, you know, you ever ask yourself, what is the ultimate goal? You know, what is the greatest what is it that you want? You know, and I think it through the Bible. I'm like, if there was just a verse, and this is while I'm driving down Sunday morning while you guys are worshiping, <laughs> praying, and uh, I was just thinking, what if there was a, if there was only a verse, God, that would just kind of guide me and direct me, that would be great. Something that would show me like the greatest commandment. <laughs> and as soon as I prayed that, I realized, oh yeah, there is one that talks about the greatest commandment. And Jesus, God, told me as I was driving down, He said. Love me. That's it. That's why you're going down there. I already love you. And he said, yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of that, sure, you love me. Kind of debate that, what was it, Peter had, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I get down there, and I'm still kind of in my question, like, all right, let's see some cool stuff. And Todd, Todd gets up to speak there on that first day. And he starts talking about how if you, it's not about seeing things. You know what I mean? It's not a, he said it's great when God works and you get to see signs and wonders and things. But then he said, that is all simply an overflow of your love relationship with God. And it just, it just destroyed you. And I don't know, I could, I mean, there's dozens of words spoken. Oh, I got to be close, I got to learn things. I'm digesting and digesting, and then start implementing into my life and my family's life. But you know, I kind of went down there with the attitude of God teach me a lot of stuff almost. I was sitting here, and God's like, You went down there with the attitude of a shotgun. You want to get hit. And you want to see all sorts of things. And God's like, it's not a shotgun. It's more like a slug. It's more like me and you. That's what's important. That's what he really worked on me. He said, if you just live from miracle to miracle, from wonder to wonder, from you get dry in the middle because if you don't see something after so long, then you start to, you know what I mean? You start to get like, oh, so God, you don't love me? You don't, you know? But if you, <laughs> you know what I mean, if you spoke, if you build that that secret place, if you build that relationship, if that's if the love is just there, then then what happens doesn't matter. You know what I mean? I don't know. There's so much there. So, so much. much. Yeah. So much there. Lots of notes. We'll start working. Oh yeah. Yeah. We'll start working it into the youth group. We'll start working it into my life, my family's life. We're gonna. Yeah, I, po I posted a. a Todd White's new movie. I really encourage you to watch it. I, I put it on several of your Facebooks. Not Facebooks. Your, we texted it to you. Watch that with your family. That's amazing. Amazing. That, that is amazing. We watched it yesterday afternoon at the house with Susan and Joe and her sister, I guess. Joe was still driving, but there was... Cynthia. Me, Cynthia and Robin and I. So 
courage. It will challenge your spirit. Challenge is awesome. That's wonderful. I, I can't wait to see as this thing begins to unfold in your life. I'm, I'm excited. Mm. Oh, so the second book of David, I was grief. That was sort of a setup that God was doing in my life. Right? And there's been about a dozen things like that leading up to this thing that I would have, I kind of walk into new stuff like this. Kind of like, um, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. When I first came to this church, it was like, okay, let's be friends. <laughs> so that was my, that's my tendency, right? And then, I mean, we had conversations about stuff that we were going to start teaching our kids. I, God led me to teach the teens for five or six weeks. Uh -huh. salvation, is not, salvation is not just about going to heaven and avoiding hell. There's so much more. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And you see how God sort of setting me up, you know what yeah. I mean? So that was, that was really cool. And God's used each of you in so many ways that you might not know or see in inspiration. So God is all over all that. Praise the Lord. Rick, you have a word to read that you, God gave you this week? A few of the passages out, great. You pass these out. Uh, this is a word from Jeremiah Johnson this week. A uh, few passages out, Joseph. Every family gets one. Every family has a word from the Lord. That We've had some wonderful moments in prayer this week. I encourage you to participate if all possible. Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, 7 to 8, the church is open. We've been gathering for prayer. That was an incredible presence this last Friday. That was amazing. So I just encourage you. We've been giving God a meal a day. Uh, I want to do this really bad this morning. Really, really, really bad this morning, but I did. So God, I just want more of you. So I shared this on Facebook. Some of you have seen it um, Friday morning during the, the prayer time. God spoke and he said, Many of you have yet to set your feet in the direction of eternal purpose. Temporal desires fill your hearts. Eternal joy is far from your mind and emotions. Heaviness of life is the result of short-sightedness. Eternal perspective changes temporal priorities. What is truly important? What is really necessary in your life? What is, who is the author and finisher? You have set priorities over temporal responsibility, and you have used it as an excuse to not enjoy my presence. Is there no comprehension of eternal priorities? The key to that whole thing is in the questions that God asks. When God says, what is truly important? I mean, what is truly important? Like Reed said, what, what, what's the purpose of it all? What's the purpose of life? You know, what's the purpose of our life as children of God? What is really necessary in your life? And who is the author and finisher? It's like when we try to amass stuff for our own comfort and, and for our own security and our own well-being, is that really what's important in life? Is that really what's necessary in life? And who is the author and finisher? Are we running out trying to make our own destinies? Are we running out trying to accomplish our own plans and desires? Or is God the author and finisher? He said that, that he stitched us together in our mother's womb and he laid out all our days before we even lived one. So who are we to think that we can accomplish our own destinies? It doesn't make sense. So there are eternal priorities on this earth. Amen. There's souls. There's the kingdom. Advancing the kingdom. Loving God. Loving people. Those are eternal priorities on this earth. And if we live our life trying to accomplish things at the cost of those priorities, then we've missed the point. So. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Wednesday Bible study. Levi. Abraham this week. Great study we've been having. 
really have so much enjoyed it. I want to talk about repentance and revival. We've often said here, how many would like to really see a great move of God in Holland's Wyoming? Who would like to see a great move of God here on a Sunday morning? Yeah. Uh, I mean, who, really? Often in our life, we just kind of get satisfied with the status quo, and that's just the truth we do. It's even in our in the natural sometimes. Go somewhere like at school there in Texas. Todd White. Watch that video, and all of a sudden you're not so satisfied with the status quo no more. Not really. So much more. Historically, there have been some amazing moves of Holy Spirit in the 20th and 21st century. It's like amazing. There's been the Welsh Revival, the Azusa Revival, the Toronto Blessing, the Hebrides Revival, the Brownsville Revival. I remember us watching the video here of the lady in Alabama at that church where she was a paraplegic, literally, had been for years. And God healed her, watched her take her first few steps, watched her come back a week later and literally danced before the Lord on that stage. And it just rocked my world to see. Or watch Todd White minister in that video. Watch people that had short legs and watch them. As you're watching, you watch it grow. I mean, watch it. The, am I telling you the truth? Yeah, I mean, the students coming back every day. Same every story is over and over. They actually go there to their school. They go out, they go out street ministry. Yeah, it's part of it's part of the school. And you go out, it's street ministry. It's, it's you beginning to do what God has called you to do. And then the tremendous love. Yes. God is doing some amazing things in the day in which we live. And sometimes we just, we just live in our own little tiny messed up bubble some days. And I feel like God is wanting to take and, and challenge us. And yes, Rollins is worth it. Yeah. Rollins is worth it. Yeah. I've heard great words spoken over Rollins. And it's like Rollins is worth it. God wants to do something. One of the big misconceptions that we have is that we don't have to do anything. And God's just going to do it all. Right? We can just, we just sit somewhere like a lump on the log. And, 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 and God just does it all if we don't do anything. And that's, that is a, that's a big misconception. Revival is not all of a sudden one day in Rollins, Wyoming, God just suddenly did something. It begins with you and I. How bad do you want to see God do something in Rollins? Are you willing to come down in the mornings and, and, and adjust your schedule? And, and make it a priority to get up a little bit early. Are you are willing to come down and pray? Are you willing to spend more time in the Word? Are you really when, are you are you willing when God gives you uh, these these divine appointments, these opportunities throughout your day to seize them? Are you just allow them to to slip on by? I, I watched Todd minister in that video, and he he seized the moments. Once he sat in a cafe or a restaurant. Just to have a meal and talked about the meal, but before he left that place, the waitress, a cook, and the delivery man were born again. And they prayed for each other. He took that little that little waitress. And before it's over, she's, she's laying her hands on the back of this man's back and praying over. That was the delivery man. He actually took it a step farther. He actually went out and helped this guy bring the stuff in from his truck. The love. Huh? The love. The love. Yeah. And he went down and, and, 
And he had to work hard for that one to bless that cook with some finances. The guy didn't want to receive it. It was like, no, 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 no. And then finally he got it. And just watch God do an amazing work. How hungry are you? Will you give up a meal a day and join in prayer? How hungry are you? How desperate do you feel? Every one of us have family. Every one of us have friends. If they were to step out into eternity tonight, where would they actually spend eternity? There's a city that's crying out. There's, there's, there's people around you 24-7 that need God's touch in their life. Evans Roberts, the great Welsh revivalist. That was a little tiny church. It only seated 60 people. But there would be another 200 standing outside and have the windows open. God didn't use the mega church. He used a little tiny church. There's always an, a, 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 an element of desperation when, when, when God's revival breaks out. We have that. That's why I include this thing with Jeremiah Thompson in here. This country... Wow. <laughs> yeah. There's a demonic horde trying to take it. I'm telling you, stop anything that God would want to do in this nation. And it's like, we have a in the middle of that, there are people that begin to get desperate. And so he laid out four principles. And the first principle is this. Confession of all known sin in your life. And that was one of the amazing things with Paul. Todd's video. He said, I don't care if it's the culture and this is what they do over here. I don't do this no more. Ministered in Amsterdam in that video and you got the girls standing like pieces of meat in the windows and he looked at them with compassion and love his heart. And he's, I mean, those were my father's daughters that the enemy has taken captive. It was a day in his life when he looked at the, you know, there's a famous head shot over there, you know. And he, he always dreamed about being able to go there. And there he was. Looking at all the weed and the seeds and all the stuff and and begin to minister to people down that gnarly old street. Take back land to the enemy. Confessing sin. And then the second thing that Evan Roberts shared was then repentance and restitution. Repentance and restitution go hand in hand. We've talked about those today. And then obedience and surrender to the purpose of Holy Spirit. I'll do what you want me to do, Holy Spirit. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. You speak the word obedience, 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 obedience. And the last thing that he shared was a public confession of Christ. I remember, and I'm going to read it as I close, when I close today, out of the book of Acts, where the early church prayed, God, give us boldness. And God rocked the place in which they, they were that day. And they went and they shared the word with great boldness. There's a plague of affliction we call sin in America today. There is. It's a plague. It's a sickness. But it's not happened by accident. There's something that has happened in our nation. Our nation has backslid. That's the truth. We sometimes approach sin so trivially. It's just kind of like, oops, I'm sorry. My bad. You know. Why didn't you say something? The truth is, for the most part, it's an intentional willful act of disobedience. That's why obedience becomes a part of this thing that perhaps revival. It's been a willful act of disobedience. Even in small areas, not just always the big areas, and even the small areas in our life. And these areas, I know God's put His finger up, because Holy Spirit is faithful. He, he, he's put the, His finger up these things in your life. You've heard Him, but you've refused to listen. And that's the truth. And then, you, then, you, then you've heard your pastors, or you've heard the prophetic word, and still it's late. 
You resist. You ignore the warning. You ignore the admonition. Like I shared, one of the problems today is that the world, and, and I want to talk to Christians, because revival is always about Christians. It really is. Till you get lit. Nothing's going to change out there. That's the truth. Nothing is going to, if Rollins were it, nothing is going to change in Rollins until you get lit. Nothing will change. But one of the problems of the day is that people think, and I can talk about Christians, they do not see sin as sin. They just see it as a problem that maybe it's just a New Year's resolution will fix. That's, that's, it's just a problem. It's not really sin. It, it's just a problem. I, I'm going to make a New Year's resolution. Oops, you know, I, I never really followed through with that resolution. And what happens when we come to that place is we don't really need a Savior. Resolution will fix it, huh? Man, if I just get up a little earlier, if I just, you know, exercise a little, if I just don't eat this and I eat that, and, and I'm a, a kinder, gentler person, I make an effort to, you know, it's like, then I really don't need a Savior, I really don't need God, I just I have my resolution, and my resolution will solve my problem. America today don't see their, see herself as needing a Savior, that's the truth. They don't see themselves. They fight it. Every, you watch. They're fighting it on every, every, every corner. It's like I don't, I, I don't see us as needing a savior. We don't see the the absolute desperateness of our nation. I mean, we got or we brag we're the superpower. You know, we brag. We got the. You know, we got. This robust economy, look what the stock market's been doing. Have you watched it, really? We've never really known what it's like to live like the nations around us. Those people coming to our southern borders, they're not a person here that understands what it's like to live where they have come from. That's the absolute truth. We don't, we don't understand what it's like. It's easy to say, we don't want you here. And I know we have to have secure borders. I know that not everybody can come across that border just a free will, but we don't understand the desperateness of the situation. Our, our poor in our nation are actually rich in theirs. That's the absolute truth. There's not a person here that probably, unless they chose not to, didn't eat three square meals today, or will eat three square meals today, or have a nice, dry, warm, safe place to sleep. So we, we give our heart to God and we're just all good. That's, that's how we feel about this thing sometimes. And, 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 and really what it's all about is just the fire insurance is in place. And that, you said it's not all about just going to heaven. My, my fire insurance is in place. I'm not going to hell and, and heaven's my home. And, and 1 John 1, 9 is just really, it's, it's become nothing more than my oops. I'm sorry. It's my bad. And why didn't you say something? It's my version of the, the New Year's resolution. And if you don't believe me, I just challenge you to listen to Christians' conversation. I don't listen to the world's conversation. I know their conversation. I challenge you to listen to Christians' conversation when they're outside of the church, not here on a Sunday morning. But when we're here on a Sunday morning, we can, we can talk the stuff. We really do. We can talk the stuff. We look good, we smell good, and we talk the stuff. But during the week, it's kind of like the, the debates, the mental debate. How, how close to the edge can I come and still be a Christian? You know, how much sin can I sin and still be a Christian? Really, I think the real question should be, is how much hell can I be and still go to heaven? How much hell can I be and still go to heaven? And the result is that Christians don't look any different than the guy across the street. That's the truth. And that's why we struggle at a funeral. It's like, you know, I, I know where I know where he was at. I mean he coached the little league and and he was just a nice guy. And and, and you know he was a real religious man. But he was a really good man. And I know I know where he's at. No, you don't. 
Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And that involves not just a magic prayer. That involves a journey in which God begins to change us. Our plumb line has become the good guy. You know what a plumb line is? Before they had levels and transits, they, they had a, a water level. They would take a, a hose, a clear hose, and you could, you could fill it full of water, and you could, you could put it to this wall, and you can, you can go over here, and when it comes to the same place on that hose, you know that's level. A plumb line is just this metal thing with a pointy tip, and you, you hang it from a height, and where the pointy thing touches the floor, you mark that from there to there is plumb. That's plumb. It's straight up and down. Our plumb line has become the good guy. Our plumb line has become, you know, my denomination. My plumb line has become my brothers and my sisters in the Lord. And our, my plumb line is not God's word. God's word has to become the plumb line. Amen. If I don't know the word, how do I know what plumb really is? I hear, I hear things come out of Christians' mouths like, it's like, man, you haven't read the word, because that, that's not what the word says. If the word is your plumb line. You can't lie if you're a Christian. I watch Christians lie all the time. I have lied at times. The Word tells me don't deceive. They that do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a plumb line. His plumb line is the Word. Well, it was just a little white lie. It was, you know, I really... Did you do this? And you go, no. I didn't. I don't. No. No. Uh -huh. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Actually, how much poison can you ingest before it kills you? Huh? How much poison can you really ingest before it kills you? I come home from church one day when I was a kid growing up. We had a neighbor and he had sheep and some wild dogs had got into those sheep. And so he took one of the carcasses and he salted it with poison. And he came over and he knew it wasn't our dog. So he said, you need to tie your dog up today. He come home from church and our dog had got loose. And got into that salted sheep. That poison. I don't remember what the poison was, but that dog went into convulsions and its eyes would bug out. I broke my heart. I mean, it was, it was my dog. How much poison can you ingest? I'll kill you. The Bible says the strength of sin is in itself. And we sometimes pretend to know that it's not there. Sin ruins lives. That was one of the things that... It was kind of interesting in that video. Todd kept saying over and over, I mean, some of you are Christians and you're doing these things. You, you cannot be doing these things. You look around you and you see, because sin is poison, you see it's affecting people's lives. Kathy ministered to, to a man that's been here and his wife has been here repeatedly <coughs> have a fierce problem with alcohol. They know what they need to do. They've reached a place they don't have the pot to pee in the window thrown out. It's ruined their lives. And he ministered to him this week and he said, I ain't going to change. 
learned how to work the system. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to change, and then your heart just absolutely breaks. It's like, wow. This is where you're headed. This was, I'm not going to change. We, we often don't like to think of sin as it relates to us because we said the magic prayer. Or we just do a little First John 1 9, but oops, sorry, my bad. And so our focus sometimes if we talk about sin in church or sinners, as we think about the guy's a silver dollar saloon last night, that's what we, you know, those, those other people. And so what happens is we sit here week after week and the altars are empty and people have dry eyes and they're not broken over their sins. I was watching part of Jeremiah Johnson video, man. I watched people rush to the I watched I watched videos in the day of that great revival in Brownsville. And I watch those altars. People would actually, even in the middle of the service, Holy Spirit conviction to get on them. And it was just down there broken on the floor. And I've got to do surgery. Got to work on them. It cost Jesus everything. This, 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 this salvation that we enjoy wasn't cheap. I, I like what she's been sharing in this Wednesday night. Study. It's like, and this epic of Eden, it's, it's like this rescue plan that God put into place. It was a complicated plan. Humanity had fell off the cliff, and there it lay, broken and dying at the bottom of the cliff. God had to figure out how. I've got to get down there, I've got to do some tree dodge. I've got to figure out how to get this person up out of where they have fallen. I've got to get them into an ICU unit somewhere. I've got to get them in the emergency room first and then the ICU unit. And it's, and it's the weeks and the months. And finally, they're able to walk out of that place. It's, this has been a complicated rescue. Grace is costly. We would treat grace sometimes like it's it's just this kind of like just drop into the you know the come and go and, and pick you up some chips and a, you know an energy drink kind of a of, of a thing you know I just I just I just blew into church this morning and, and I got my 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 my, my, my pig skins and my I like pig skins okay and 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 and, 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 and I got me my energy drink or I got me my my big hunk and I'm good. I ask you, when was the last time you were not just broken over the sins that you repented of years ago, but the stuff of the junk in your life? When was the last time you were really, I mean, broken over it? Not the oops. Not that just, you know, I'm, I'm just sorry. Yeah, my bad. When was the last time that you were really broken? In, in the world of psychology, they got a, a, a term, it's binge and purge. And, 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 and when, when somebody's caught up in a cycle of addiction, no matter what this addiction is, that's what they do. They binge and perch. They fall off the wagon. The drunk gets drunk. He goes on He goes on a bender. You know, the dope fiend, he goes on a bender. You know, the guy chases the girls. The girls chase the guy. It's, it's the binge. Then it's like in the middle of all of that, and suddenly, you know, you come to a place where they get purged, and, and it's like they, they pour their alcohol down the sink and swear, I will never drink again. Only they throw the, the cigarettes out the window of the car, and they chew, only to drive back around the corner and pick it back up. Well, that afternoon they're down to come and go get them some more. It's binge and perch. When you quit falling on your knees before God, something happens on the inside of you. You actually 
you'd actually die inside. And this thing is really painful to admit. When I ask you, when was the last time that you, you really were broken over your sin? This is a thing that's really painful to admit. First of all, I have to admit it to a very holy God, right? It's God, you know, you... There are things in my life and thoughts and feelings my wife don't know. Come on, guys. Some of you gals, there's thoughts and feelings your husband don't know. That's the truth. Within families. God knows. Our second reason for not falling on our knees and repenting because of our fear of man. I mean, what would Pastor and Robin think if I was down here at the altar this morning and I was broken before the Lord? I remember one time when I was a kid, we didn't get no goodies. They had night services and we didn't get no goodies if we fell asleep. So we'd sit there as teenagers trying to stay awake. And it's like, because we stayed awake. Then afterwards, when at home, we always had goodies after church. I got goodies, otherwise we just had to go to bed. And it was like, I went down to the altar and I fell asleep. <laughs> and the ladies were all gathered around me and they were just been, oh dear Jesus, look at this teenager. He's just down here. He's so serious in his relationship with God. You know, they were all, I wake up and they're all around me praying. Dad never knew. I said, not good that night. He didn't know. Huh? Yeah. What would my church family think if they see me down there broken? Huh? What would my church family think? Because they believe I got it all together. Pastor's just got it all together. Huh? No, Rex just got it all together. Levi's got it all together. Well, the truth is I don't. And it's a lie. And I know it's a lie. So I walk out the door with my pride intact. I'll see you again next week, brother. That was good today. But my pride is intact. I haven't run to the altar and I haven't cried out before God. One of the things that's kind of interesting, you know, you minister to the guys in penitent, there is no victimless crime. You know that? It don't matter what that crime is. We have certain crimes we figure are worse than others. But there is no victimless crime, and that's the absolute truth. There are no victimless crimes. And when we hurt, well, I mean, let me back up. When we live, in our junk, we have victims because of our junk. We just do. It doesn't matter whether you were crabby patty before you walked out of the whole house in the morning and the things that came out of your mouth as a crabby patty. There are victims. There are people who have been impacted. Some of them might even want to know, man, God, what do I need to pray with you about, brother? Dear God, now, I couldn't even be honest there. You know, it's like, wow, I can't be honest there. So we say to ourselves, I'll take care of it later in private where I'm safe. <clears throat> Let me ask you, how well has that been working out in your life? Huh? It's kind of like, one of the things I love about Todd White is like, you have somebody and you know you see the need, and you know you should minister to them, or somebody shares a, a, you know, a need with you, man, it's like, my mom is really sick, you know, I've been, man, I, I'm, I'm struggling with, with something, and it's like, we'll pray for you. 
pray for you. We'll pray for your family, brother. Why don't you seize the moment and pray? It's your clue the, of, of your assignment. There's a need. There's a need. You see the limp as they walk down the sidewalk. You don't need a hand any bigger than that. Man, do you mind if I pray over your hip? Huh? In the middle of that, I put my arm around you and I love on you a little bit. You may be a little bit defensive until I put my arm around you and I love on you. And then all of a sudden the defensiveness goes away. If you don't take care of things, you know what God gets forced to do? Huh. Anybody here a parent? Come on. Huh? You speak to your kids, and if it doesn't bring correction, what are you ultimately forced to do? I watched Rick grab Noah today and jerk him in my office. He was sitting out there looking at them steps. Was he not? And, and, and Rick said, get in here, and he wouldn't get in there. So, so what, what did Dad have to do? What would you do, Rick? I grabbed him by the arm and drug him in the office. You grabbed him by the arm and you drug him in my office. <laughs> he didn't get the option to take a look at them stairs. Because that boy's fast. You turn your head, he's like... <laughs> huh? He is. He didn't get the option. And so God is forced, because of His great love for us, to bring us to an end of ourselves. Read the lives of Samson and David and Jonah and the prodigal son and Peter and Paul and the Corinthian believers that Rick preached on. Huh? If we don't step into the room with Pop, God's going to have to step outside of the room, grab you by the arm and drag you in here because He loves you. He loves you. There's a couple reasons we don't deal with our sin. The first one is really obvious. I like my sin. <laughs> Woo! Sin is fun. For a short time. It is. It's fun. For a short time. It's fun. So we don't want to really deal with it. <laughs> oh, we may get to a binge and purge. With the idea that, you know, yeah. I was really bad, so I throwed it all out. Now I'm going to go give you some more. Because it's fun. The second reason that we don't deal with it is pride. Yep. It's pride. Yep. Because it's a fearful thing to get God honest. It is a fearful thing to get God honest in our life. It's a fearful thing to get God honest. And so pride causes us not to deal with the stuff in our life. We care more about something or someone I could lose if I got honest than what I might lose in my relationship with God. See, in these great revivals, as people have actually repented, they've confessed their sin, they've repented. God then becomes free to begin. See, God will never confirm his confirmed flesh. Mark 16 says, that, that's, that's why Todd is such a fanatic about this thing. He walks in an anointing. And he's not willing to surrender that anointing for things and stuff. He's not willing to. I will not surrender the anointing in my life for things or stuff. I don't want to lose the relationship I have with God. If God gets a group of people and they begin to seek His face and they begin to confess and they begin to repent and they get rid of the stuff that's blocked the flow of the Holy Spirit in their life, what begins to happen? All of a sudden, you have worship services that see. God can confirm His Word. Mark 16, He confirmed His Word. He says He worked with it. He confirmed His Word with signs and wonders. He is not going to confirm flesh worship. 
He will not confirm Christ's worship. You may have a lot of talent, and we may go boom, shaka laka laka boom, shaka laka. He is not going to confirm flesh. But when I worship His Spirit-led, man, I'm telling you what, and the presence of God gets thick, He will confirm it. The presence of God will get thick. He isn't going to take and confirm His Word in prayer time if it's just rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, yay God, amen, brothers and sisters. But if you confirm His Word, if you've been on your face before the Lord during the week, hearing from the Holy Spirit, and then you walk into here and you say, Brother, I want to pray for you, He will confirm the Word. When you stand to share in a Bible study, or you stand to share the Word, the youth group, or in a jail, or in a prison, or from this pulpit, and you've been on your face before God, and you know that there is nothing, there's no compromise, you'll stand in the middle of that with an anointed and God can confirm it because it's not flesh. They have, they have places you can actually go and get you a year's worth of sermon outlines. <laughs> a year to whack. That's not Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is when you say, God, there's these people, what do they need to hear? What do I need to share with them? And Holy Spirit says, this is my word for them this week. <laughs> sometimes you got to wait on the Lord. Don't just, sometimes it just doesn't happen. Sometimes it does. It's amazing. There are times I've had a busy week and all of a sudden just God give me a word. And it's like, woo! And then there's times that God says, I want you to date this week. And in my dating, I get blessed. I uncover nugget after nugget after nugget and I get blessed. I say, oh, thank you, Father. I'm so glad I dug this week. And God can confirm that word. Repentance. To understand repentance, first of all, you need to understand what repentance is. Okay? It's not just feeling sorry for your sin. That's not repentance. It's a part of but it's so much more than that. Worldly sorrow is actually this. It's selfish and it's self-centered. When someone asks you to forgive them, a lot of times it's more about them than about you. I haven't really hurt you, but, but I've got this great big guilty conscience and I just want to be free from my guilty conscience. I really haven't had a change of mind or change of direction in this thing. It's really about me. Those guys out there at the penitentiary, they're, they're not any different than us. It's, it's sorry that they got caught. Huh? It's sorrow that your sin actually cost you something. You're going you're gonna to be doing a lot of time. This worldly sorrow is sorrow that you have to pay the consequence. God says his work be not deceived, but you still will read. Like it or not, huh? Like it or not, you plant weeds, you get weeds, so to speak. You sow bad seed, that's what you're going to have a harvest of, bad seed. The good news there is if you ultimately begin to plant good seed, ultimately your, your harvest of the bad seed will end and the good harvest will begin to come in. That's right. In the Hebrew, there's couple definitions I want to share about repentance. One means to lament or grieve. See, it's not just tears, it's grieving. Oh, God. How many of you are really broken? You grieve. And the second is a radical change of mind towards the sin and it implies a conscious moral separation of sin a decision 
to forsake it. I make a decision. I grieve and I make a decision. I grieve and I make a decision. It means to turn around and head the opposite direction. That's what it means. I turn around and I head the opposite direction. I grieve over this day. I am really, I'm broken over my sin. It's not to manipulate you. And in the Greek, there's also a couple words. And the first part is to have remorse. This is a great thing when a guy out there finally reaches a place in his journey to penitentiary. He actually begins to think more about who he injured than what it cost him. He quits fighting all of the, the legal stuff and he actually wants to write that letter that says, I am so sorry. I know that I robbed you and broke into your home and I stole the sense of security that you had. Because your home was supposed to be a safe place. And I stole that from you. I hurt you. It's a wonderful place when they come to that place. All of a sudden, it's not this struggle to do time. It's It brings a peace. In our own life, God wants the same thing to happen. We come to a place where there's remorse. And we're really sorry. And the second part of that Greek word, it's a radical change. There's a radical change. I watch it in the lives of some of those guys. All of a sudden their family's kind of blown away. They get the phone call or they get the letter. And it's no longer a guilt trip. It's no longer, well, you know, when we was growing up, this is what you did. Raising kids, you never came with an instruction manual, did you? No, there's, if you're a parent, you're going to make mistakes. And boy, sometimes we, my mama said to me one time, you looked at a lot of things through kids' eyes. Trying to figure out what was wrong in the home, and I was just looking at it through kids' eyes. So repentance is a change of mind, a change of direction. Directing our emotions to urge the required change, the action of a yielded will, and turning away from sin and to God. The great New Testament picture is the prodigal son. He takes his inheritance, he goes to the far country, he squanders it. So he squandered his inheritance. The, the country that he had, he had fled to all of a sudden their economy collapses. He can't find a job. He, he knows that if he goes home, we shared the story, he can only go home as a servant. He could not go home as a son. Because in their culture of that day, they would break the picture. The clan would rush out there to meet the son. They would break the picture. And all he could go home as is a servant and he waited to the last minute because that was a that was the one thing he did not. I mean, the pride. I tried to. I tried. I, I even worked for this guy that had fakes. I'm trying to recover what I lost, but I can't. I can't even keep body and soul together. And so he rehearses and he says, "I'm willing. I'll go back as a servant." So he goes to his father, his father, but he don't even get through his whole, his whole conversation. He says, I've sinned against God and you. And I'm not worthy to be a son. I know that they've got the family, the, the clan, is going to break the, 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 the pitcher pot. But the dad had already ran. He'd already put the robe on his shoulder, the ring on his finger, the shoes on his feet. And he would be still a son. When we talked about the celebration, the feast was not a, a, a celebration for the son. It was a celebration over the father. Oh, look what the father has done. Look what the father has done. So the godly sorrow is not selfish. It's a sorrow that our sins has offended God. 
It's a sorrow that your sin has hurt somebody else. It's a sorrow that causes you to hate your sin. Yeah. Hate. Your, hate's a strong word. But you come to a place where you literally hate your sin. It becomes repugnant to you. I hate it. Do you hate it when your eyes are drawn away in lust? Do you hate it? Do you hate it when the desire is in your heart to feed your addiction? Do you hate it when the unkind words come out of your mouth or the cursing? Do you hate it? The desire with all your heart is to turn, to change, and be set free from this thing. Yeah. Oh, amen. Hey, that's what I love about is walking down that street in Amsterdam. And there's them scantily clad, good looking girls in the windows. And he said, I look at her and I see them as the gods. I got the father's daughters. For his daughters. For his daughters. There are 56, 54 specific references to repentance in the New Testament. There are 16 in the Old. What was John the Baptist's main message? Yes. Repent. That was his main message. Yep. Repent. What did he say to the Pharisees, the religious? You go. I'm not going to baptize you. You go. Come back. When you can show me the fruit that you've repented, then I'll baptize you. That was his message. Repentance. What was Jesus' message? Same message. What was the message of the early church? Same message. Repent. <clears throat> yeah. It's not much preached in a lot of churches today, I'm telling you the truth. We love the blessed me, prosper me. Ooh. Huh? People really have a very big idea what repentance really is. Oops, sorry. My bad. Why didn't you tell me? Repentance is a thorough work. The Holy Spirit of rooting out the sin in my life. It's a, it's, it's a, it isn't a magic prayer. These guys out there, contender, have to laugh sometimes. They, 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 you know, they have this, and it's good. Don't get me wrong. Jailhouse conversion is good. They have a jailhouse conversion, and they come there to the penitentiary, and they say, "Sir, you're going to have to go to group." Well, I'm offended by that. I mean, go to a group. I, the Bible says I'm a new creature in Christ. And I want to say, no, the same old ugly you still lives between those two shoulder blades. And that's the absolute truth. And if I push your buttons, it will manifest itself. And that's the truth. And so, there is this process where God begins to deal with our junk. And the sin is rooted out. Yeah. And it's not a shallow thing. It's not a haphazard thing. It's not a half-hearted attempt to gain absolution and freedom from the guilt. It's only to repeat the cycle over next week. And the week after. Yeah. And the week after. Do you know the guys that beat their wife? Mostly never get set free from that. They don't. Unless there has been a work. That's right. There's a lot of things that there's not an easy fix for until the work is done. And it gets rooted out. Repentance bears fruit. <laughs> That's what Galatians, that, that, yeah. you know, it's the fifth chapter. Yeah. Huh? We just talk about the fruit of the Spirit. It's fruit. 
Fruit is not a gift. It's not something I give you. God doesn't just give you. It's like that with absolution. You just get this. Here it is, Joey. You know? If you're struggling with porn, it isn't just, you know, the last solution you repented. Here it is. Huh? Yeah. Real repentance is a work that the Holy Spirit has to do in your life that ultimately will bear fruit. Yeah. And fruit is something that has to be grown. It's not the gift. It's grown. It it's a process. It takes... It takes it takes a process to bring the change. And it becomes a change that can be seen. Can be seen. What's restitution? That was another one of the things that was in that passage that I read you about the, the Welsh Revival. Restitution is you have to make things right. That, that that deals with that pride thing again. It's really hard to make things right. It really is. There are some things that God's putting His finger on in you, your life. You have to make right. Repentance is costly. There was that storm I shared with you with Jonah. They took and cast lots. The lot fell on him. They came and asked him. What is going on with you and your God, man? If the, the reason the ship is about ready to sink to go down, it's you. And he said, it is me. I'm running from God. And he's called on my life. But I'll tell you what. And he didn't even know there was going to be a, a, a fish. There would be a resurrection. They throw him into the ocean. He said, he'll throw me in the storm, will cease. They tried everything for a little bit and it didn't work. And finally, in their desperation, they throw him into the ocean. And like he said, it, for Jonah to repent, it cost him something. He had to come to a place where he said, it's me. It's me. It's me. And until this thing is dealt with radically, things aren't going to change in this situation. Sometimes that's true in a marriage. Until this thing is dealt with, this marriage is not going to get better. It's sick. I'm willing. If you'll throw me into the ocean, this thing will get better. David. David had numbered Israel. It was a sin. Because Israel should rely upon God and not on numerical numbers to take in. God was king. In a sense, he numbers Israel against Joab's advice, and a plague breaks out, and 70,000 people die. And David is broken over this thing, and he has a conversation. He knows he needs to offer a sin offering and a peace offering. And so, where he's at, there happened to be a thrashing floor. And the guy said to him, I'll give you this threshing floor and I'll give you the cattle. You take an offer, a, a, a burnt offering for the sin and a, and a peace offering. And David said, no, it will have to cost me something. And so he bought the threshing floor and he bought the cattle and he humbled himself before the Lord. And he offered the sin offering and he offered the peace offering. And he made a statement. He said, God, let your anger fall on me. <laughs> Not Israel. Repentance cost him. I was reading this week, Robert and I were working through the book of Luke about Zacchaeus, that wee little man that climbed up in the sycamore, the, the flowering tree. Jesus came by. He was the chief of tax collector. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector over others. Jesus went to his house and the impact was so great upon him. He had a come to Jesus moment and he said half of my wealth I will just give to the poor. Half. Half. It's going to cost me. Half. And then if I have stole from anybody 
restore fourfold. Not just, not just what I owe you. I'll restore fourfold. I'm going to have some interest on this thing. My dad's kind of interesting. I remember this a long time ago. I was just a teenager. We went to my grandparents' house. My dad and mom, they were, they were terrible at handling finances in their young days. And they got into a jam and they borrowed money from my grandparents. They borrowed a thousand dollars and back then that was, a thousand dollars was, that was probably about like four months worth of wages or at least two months worth of wages. You know what I mean? That was a lot of money. And of course my dad never paid it back. Because they were out of control with their finances. So here we are, we're out here all these years later, and God has let him off the hook. I remember the day that he came to my grandfather. We all stood in the kitchen in my grandfather's house. And my grandfather by then was well-to-do. He had been a successful farmer. He retired from another job. They had lots of money in the bank. They lived in a beautiful <laughs> home. He didn't need that thousand bucks. My dad said, his name was Alec. He said, hand him an envelope. He said, Alec. And my grandpa was like, no, 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 you, you don't have to. And he said, no, I have to. I have to make this thing right. I've got to make it right. Huh? Yeah. For sake of time, I'm not going to read the following verses, but you can read in the book of Exodus, the 22nd chapter. Restitution. In Leviticus 6, restitution. In Numbers 5, restitution. Proverbs 14, verse 9, talks about restitution. Matthew 5, we talk about restitution. Galatians 6, 1, actually talks about restoration. What's actually restoration? We say the word, it's restitution. Making things right is a vital part of repentance. Most of us, our idea of repentance is just to... It's all better. I'm going to say, no, I ain't going to let you off the hook that easy. Prodigal son, you don't have to go face dad. And you're going to have to say, I sinned against you and my father, Devin. I sinned. No, David, I'm not going to let you off the hook. No, Jonah, I'm not going to let you off the hook. No, Zacchaeus, I'm not going to let you off the hook. I'm not going to let you off the hook. You've got to make this thing. you got to make this thing right. So as we get ready to close, the four principles are this. First of all, confession of all known sin. Repentance and restitution. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you'll do what? You'll do what? You will obey. Oh, I love God. How do you? Todd's talking about love. We have this idea, love has... It's like, it's, it's just a cheap four-letter word. It's a Hallmark greeting card. It's not a Hallmark greeting card. It's, it's a real sacrifice. It's if I love God, it's a real sacrifice. If I love my neighbor as myself, it's a real sacrifice. If I love my enemy, it's a real sacrifice. It's real. If you love me, You'll obey. You'll obey. You'll obey. And last, a public confession of Christ. Go to Acts, Isaac 4. We're going to read 24 through 31. This is our closing scripture. And then he has a couple of videos for us. So the early church is ministering just like Todd White's ministering. 
So mum got thrown into the prison. And so they threatened them. They were down in the private bar hotel when they threatened them, so to speak. And they couldn't decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. Next verse. For the man who was miraculous healed was over 40 years old while they had a miracle. Next verse. On the release, Peter and John went back to their own people and they reported. They came right here to church with the family. And they reported all the chief priests and the elders who said to them. They said a lot of things to them. You will preach no more in this name. <laughs> when they heard this, they raised their voice together and they prayed. This was their prayer. I, I pray it's our prayer today as we close. Yes. My prayer is, yes. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against His anointed one. Read this thing with Jeremiah Johnson. Go ahead. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They've conspired. I look at the, the political climate today. They have conspired against our Lord. And that's the truth. That's right. And they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. He's still the king. He's still in control. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. That's my prayer today. Enable your people here to speak your word with great boldness. Yes. Go ahead, next verse. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miracles and signs and wonders through the name of your Holy Spirit, Jesus. Because, I'll tell you why, I have confessed the sin in my life. I have repented and I've made restitution. And I am obedient, 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 obedient. And the Holy Spirit can confirm His Word through my life. Yes. Next verse. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. Yeah. Wow. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they went from that place and they spoke the Word of God. Boldly. Boldly. I see the guy limping down the sidewalk and he's going to pray for you. I'm in my workplace. And this little girl's going through all kinds of stuff. And Robin says, can I pray for you? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. You're in your workplace. And some guy said, man, I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet. There's days I just, I just want to hop off a bridge. I said, man, I can speak into your life. I have great bones. But you can't do all these things when your life is full of dirt. Yeah. Come on, it, you can't. You can't. When you don't look no different than people you're trying to minister to. He can't do anything through you. Read the history. They turned their world upside down. Yeah. And in these great revivals that I shared with you, man, in the middle of this kind of environment, God could then show up. In the middle of that, God can... Who wants God to show up in Rollins, Wyoming? Come on! Who wants God to show up in Rollins, Wyoming? Who wants God to show up in Rollins, Wyoming? Yes. In your family. In your family. In, in your, your workplace. workplace. Huh? Who doesn't want God to show up in your family? In your workplace. To chart out your destiny? To chart out your destiny? I do. Who doesn't want God? Yeah. So I invite you to the altars just today. I invite you. Is there something in your life that's dealing with? Don't worry about what the past 
Pastor Robin think? What will my brothers or sisters think? Something got to make you about. Don't lie to yourself and walk out the door and say, I'll take care of it later. Take care of it today. I invite you. I invite you to give a little right come to that prayer time. I invite you to take it and say, God, I won't give you a meal a day. Wow. That time is just me and your time. That time is just me and your time. It's not skip the meal and then play on Facebook. That's me and your time. And see what God will begin to do in this city. Would you play that song?